Hello, welcome. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Gavin Bannerman and I'm the Director of Queensland Memory at the State Library of Queensland. Thank you for joining us for third instalment of Research Reveals with Seth Ellis today. Um, I'm currently on leave and I'm on North Stradbroke Island, on Minjerraba, and I think it was wholly appropriate to acknowledge the traditional owners of where I am and where everyone else who is viewing this um, presentation are beaming in from. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Kwandamurka people who've had ongoing connection to the land and waters around North Stradbroke Island for generations and generations. And that is a large part of why I keep coming back and why so many others are drawn to North Stradbroke Island, the result of that continual custodianship and stewardship of the land and waters. And for the rest of across Australia, I think it's something that we all cherish and are very thankful to be living in a place with the longest continuing culture in the world. Um, acknowledging what's happened before and what will happen in the future is an important part of what we do at State Library of Queensland and particularly with our Queensland memory material and our fellowship talks such as these. Um, we really take the time to stop, pause and reflect on uh, what has come before us. So this year is uh, the last re research reveal um, event for the year. Um, the next one is on the 15th of February, 2021. So put that in your calendars. It will be a Zoom event similar to this um, format with Trisha King, who is the 2019 Placemaking Fellow, discussing her research about Peter's Ice Cream Factory in West End in Brisbane. All the research reveals events are available um, on our website where the events have been recorded and you can see those um, videos played back through State Library's website. So I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Seth Ellis. Um, first of all, I'd also like to thank the people who made this presentation possible. The Queensland Library Foundation and Dr. Catherine Middlehauser AM have been um, hugely uh, instrumental in making this program possible. The Middlehouse Scholar in Residence uh, enables researchers to delve into our collections and look at new forward thinking ideas that will benefit the galleries, libraries, archives and museums, GLAM sector in Queensland and beyond. A sincere thanks to Dr. Catherine Middlehauser for her valued support of State Library and for making this scholarship possible. Seth is a narrative artist and interactive designer. He's also a senior lecturer in interactive media at Queensland College of Art in, at Griffith, Griffith University. In 2019, Seth was awarded the Middlehouse Scholar in Residence for his project, Sound as Historical Material, developing a new way of catalog, cataloging, describing and accessing sound in the archive. Um, Seth will be giving a presentation um, now so he'll be we're swapping the camera over to him where he'll be giving a live um, presentation um, there's a QA and a function in zoom where we encourage you to pop your questions or thoughts or reflections down in that q a area in zoom uh, and then at the end of the presentation we'll have the opportunity through those questions that have been passed through to to put them to seth to respond to so um without further ado i'll hand it over to seth and uh, let him let him at it thank you all right, thank you, Gavin. So I would also like, well, I'd like to thank you all for being here. It's uh, great to have this opportunity. I would also like to thank the people who are responsible for the opportunity, Dr. Catherine Middlehauser AM and the Queensland Library Foundation. And of course, I would like to pay my respects to um, the traditional custodians of the land where I am in Paddington in Brisbane, uh, the Turbul and Jaguar people and their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and so now let's just begin. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get on with the show. And if you can't, if at any point somebody can't hear me or whatever, like technical issues, of course, let me know. Okie dokie, here we go. So Sound as Historical Material is the name of my research project. And for a little bit of context, um, I was of, of the Queensland Memory Awards. I was the Middlehauser Scholar in Residence, which aims, and I quote, to develop new ideas, tools, strategies, and services that benefits um, Queensland's GLAM and the State Library. 
Uh, and this means that my purview is a little bit more maybe, maybe meta than some of the other fellows in the library this year. Um, I was about, I was thinking about methodologies, thinking about doing research more than I perhaps was really deeply engaged in a particular avenue of research. And this sort of was borne out over um, the course of my project. I was thinking more about sound and more about the ideas behind treating sound as historical material, how we catalog it, how we describe it. Uh, and so my intent here in coming to the Middlehauser uh, and what I pitched to uh, Gavin and all the wonderful people at uh, Queensland Memory was first off to de develop some methods for um, thinking about how we already use sound and how we could use sound in an archival and collection setting. And then well, that's sort of on the back end. And then on the front end, think about um, how we use sound in exhibition design and how we use it in uh, public facing enterprises in order to create new relationships between the audience, between users and uh, the collected materials, in this case, audio, visual, um, and specifically sound materials. And so in order to do that, I had two um, practical outcomes, one of which has come to pass and one of which I'm still very excited about working on. Um, the first is really just a set of tools. Um, a set of methodologies um, in, this, in, the, in the form of specifically, I started out as a web developer and web programmer. So I created some web tools for myself to, to help catalog sound materials and think about how to catalog sound materials in uh, the state library's collections. And then next, um, what I'm still embarked on in part because of COVID-19 has made travel and, and uh, physical research a bit harder. Um, is a test case in which I'm going to use some sound materials in State Library and some sound materials elsewhere to um, build a sort of public facing interface uh, that explores this idea of sound as historical material and how sound actually informs um, not just what we know about the past informationally, but our sense of the past, how we experience it affectively. So why sound? Um, Gavin asked, the, asked me this question right before I went on, so I thought I would answer. Um, well, first off, sound is a very important sensory trigger for memory on the individual level. Uh, sounds that I hear in everyday life might suddenly not just remind me of past experiences from my childhood, for instance, but they'll actually sort of, and there's a lot of research around this, they'll sort of break down the barrier between my present experience and my past experience. So it's almost like I'm reliving that past experience by hearing that very familiar sound. It's a not just pre-intellectual, but also almost a pre-emotional sort of journey that I take through this um, sensory experience. The most, um, perhaps, uh, the easiest ex um, example to explain would be trauma. Um, in particular, let's say, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a bit, um, the trauma of a war vet who hears sirens and automatically thinks of, or hears fireworks and automatically thinks of bombs dropping. A single sound, however, is also, well, as we can see from that sort of example and from, from thinking about sound in that way, a single sound is the result of a very complex network of individual memories, of social memories, of social um, uh, developments that brought a society to the place where that noise might be made and that then I experienced that noise and then I remember it later. Um, so sound isn't just a physical experience. It's not just an immediate visceral sensation. It also embodies, or at least uh, it forces us to consider a lot of story behind what created that sound and the way in which I listened to that sound as well. And so that's a, that's a lot. That's not really the way that we think about objects in archives, whether they're written objects or uh, you know archival um, collected objects like uh, um, household goods. And it's also um, something to think about in a historical sense. What I've been talking about in sound and memory is much more on a personal level. I hear a sound that I heard as a child or in a stressful moment. What does it mean to think about historical sound in the sense of this is what the soundscape was, or this is the sonic nature of this place at this time? Um, that can be a very powerful affective tool for people who were there at that time. What does it mean for people who weren't there? What can we, how can we investigate the past through evoking, remembering, reconstructing these sounds? Well, I won't go into too much detail on um, 
the sort of literature behind this, but I do want to just sort of open some ideas around this because it'll explain what I think I'm doing. Uh, and this is more about sort of sound and memory on that individual, very personal level of um, uh, breaking down a visceral barrier between present and past experience. Uh, um, this is about sound memories of the Nazi period. Um, Constance Birdsall did a lot of research into how people remember and how they reflect on that time. And this is certainly something that uh, my grandmother actually, who is Dutch and who lived through the Nazi occupation, this is something that drew me to this topic because she had exactly this experience. Um, she, uh, there was a certain kind of siren that she didn't hear again for decades, but then later after emigrating to the US living in suburban Utah, uh, she suddenly heard a siren that for some reason was immediate, was exactly the sound of an air raid in 1943 in Rotterdam. And the next thing she knew, she was under a table. Like there was, there was no um, thoughts, no even emotion. There was just like the immediate physical reaction. Um, and this is quite common, as it turns out, for people who've lived through war, lived through um, those heightened experiences. And um, what's, what was also interesting to me reading about this and not just hearing about it from my grandmother was that the degree to which people perform sounds, the degree to which people uh, rely on the way that the past sounded in order to get their point across when they're narrating a past experience to people. So that, for instance, many interviewees, as, I say, as it says here, when they're talking about an, an air raid or they're talking about their experience, they will perform the sound of sirens and they'll perform the sound of falling bombs, not because they're doing it super well, but because that's a, an immediate visceral part of their experience. And that's a part of this experience of storytelling. So even without access to the original sounds, even without access to a reconstructive technology, there's something really powerful about explaining sounds to each other with even without um, replaying them for each other. And then in the historical sense, this is what I mean by moving from the personal to the historical. What does that mean? Um, a lot of what interests me about sound in the historical sense is how inaccessible it is, strangely enough, in sort of, I guess, a poetic, metaphorical way. It represents to me not just how evocative the past can be and how present it is for us, but also how ephemeral it is or how difficult it is to grasp because the large majority of sounds that have been made by humans over the many millennia just don't exist anymore. They were never recorded. Sounds, of course, only exist for a moment and then they're gone. So unless somebody was sitting there with some kind of recording medium, the sounds are just vanished. Um, Riello's uh, point here is about in the 18th century, um, women in London wore patens, which were these big uh, platform shoes to keep your, your nice shoes, your good shoes off the, out of the mud. Um, and in London, for some reason, they wore steel patens. They were sort of like metal. So uh, everybody, like every fashionable woman in, in London was tottering around making this horrible clattering noise on the cobblestones. And this was apparently a, an immediate uh, sense association that Continentals had with London was all the, the ladies and their, their clattering shoes, which is not something, I mean, we might see it mentioned somewhere and then wonder about it, but that immediate experience is gone. And yet for me, at least, um, hearing about that and trying to imagine, oh, that's what that's like. Suddenly it makes that time come alive in a way that it wasn't by just reading history books. So let's think about some examples. I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm still working up to the things that I actually researched in the, um, in the library itself, but thinking about how we're used to researching sound, how we're used to seeing it represented and um, how uh, Maybe we, those, those ways are maybe a bit insufficient. Just um, to nail the point home here that uh, many sounds that have been made over the years uh, just weren't recorded. Or if they were, they weren't recorded in a way that we can replay because technologies change. Um, some, some of you might have seen this travel around social media as a meme. It is, in theory, the sound of armistice, armistice on uh, 11th of November, 1918. Um, it was reconstructed from seismographs, basically. These seismographs were being used to trace the impact of bombs. Um, and some, some clever folks in the past few years decided to treat those, their vibrations, right? So they tried to, decided to treat them as sound waves in order to try to reconstruct um, what the armistice might have sounded like. This is through the Imperial War Museum. Not 
da da, the war's over. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume that you could hear that. If, if, if you can't hear it, let me know somehow. Um, uh, now, this is very evocative. It's very, or it's meant to be very evocative. Um, and it's, it's based in a reconstruction from this, um, uh, what looks like a spectrogram, a, a visual representation of, of sound. It's a fake though. Um, I mean, it's not a fake in the sense that it's, um, it's certainly based on, uh, you know, the real, um, uh, sound was great. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Just had to check with, check in with my people. There. Um, it's certainly based in the real uh, seismographs that were made at that time. It's based in the actual uh, um, record of the physical ground. But you know, there's there's some poetic license there. They then said, "Oh, that's probably a bomb." Well, this is what bombs sound like. Let's just you know re-record a bomb and, and stick it in there. And this is what a lot of historical sounds consist of. It consists of speculation and our best guess. Um, and so one thing you might have noticed about that is that it sounds a lot like a war movie because we all know what war sounds like from having seen so many films. Um, so there's always a question about what we're listening to. Um, there's always that sort of slight gap between the real historical record and what got, um, what, what actually happened. And part of, part of the reason I like thinking about sounds is because there's always that gap. There's gap in, um, you know, Captain Cook's diary between uh, uh, what happened, what he thought happened, and what actually might have happened from another point of view. Um, sound, I think, because it's so ephemeral and because it's, there's so little of it in the historical record, it really just sort of foregrounds that idea that we always have to be listening and we have to be conscious of how we're listening and what we're listening to. So how are ways that we, as people who are interested in collections and archives, um, used to representing sounds as, let's say, collectible objects. Well, one very obvious way is um, through field recording, probably the most common way. Uh, this is at the Macaulay Library at, the, at Cornell University in the US. They have thousands and thousands of bird calls um, and are, that are being added to all the time, in fact. Um, and these are you know, sound files that you can hit play and, and hear them. They're also represented as spectrographs, which is Neat, I guess, but doesn't tell me personally a lot. I couldn't look at this um, image of a common loon call and say, ah, that's what it sounds like just from reading it visually. Um, I'm not going to play these sounds, but if you do have the chance to hear a common loon, I recommend it. It's, it's pretty wacky. Um, but so this is, this is um, the baseline of treating uh, sound as objects, drilling it down to the smallest amount of sound, like a single bird call sort of decontextualizing everything else, getting rid of all the background sound if you can, not other animals, not other birds, and just recording that as small a bit as you can. Now, the issue perhaps is that a lot of sounds take longer than that. Sounds happen um, just sort of in a part of basic life. Um, and we, when we start to think, especially about sounds, not just as the sound of people talking, um, like oral histories or uh, performances, but we start to think of sound as just things that happen in places where people are, um, just the sound of everyday life. Then we start to think that um, we need to, we need maybe longer recordings. We need to understand and uh, appreciate the context behind recordings. We need just more information than really appears in these very small object bits. Um, I might actually play a bit of this just to say that this is one of my favorite sounds. I was born sound. in Calhoun County, South Carolina, 43 years ago, and have lived here all my life. I shall recite Song of the Chattahoochee by Sidney Linnea. Out of the hills of Hal Um, So that was a, a, a recording of a woman from South Carolina, Charleston. Um, and as, as you heard, what she's going to do is she's going to read a poem. Uh, what's important, this is uh, the American English dialect recordings, which were done in the 1960s mostly. Um, and it was done specifically to save regional dialects and regional accents that were disappearing at that time due to TV and other mass media. Um, 
And uh, so it doesn't, it kind of doesn't matter what she's saying. She can say, I mean, in some of these recordings, they're all saying kind of the same thing because what matters is her vowel sounds. What matters is her consonants. What matters is the speed at which she talks. And so this is a great example to me of thinking about the, what we listen to and we're listening to a voice as we often do, but we're not, we're not really listening to what the voice is saying. We're listening to the voice itself. We're listening to the voice as a kind of sound of a place and a time. Um, and this is something that I really wanted to get to with looking at uh, the state library's materials and thinking about sound, even just going beyond uh, um, uh, language in general and thinking about sound effects. Think, we're thinking about rather the sound of everyday life. When I was first explaining this to my partner, actually, she said, oh yeah, like, like the sound of mangles um, in backyards across suburban Brisbane, uh, you know, the, the women doing laundry on a Sunday afternoon or on a weekend afternoon, that sound that you just don't hear anymore. And that was, that was a great example to me and I've remembered it ever since because I don't know what that sounded like. Of course, I, I'm new to Australia. Uh, we didn't use mangles where I'm from in the US. And so I said, oh yes, mangles. And I don't know what I'm, what I'm, I don't know what that sound was, what I'm sort of historically listening to, but I can sort of like the understanding that a sound was there that I, that I don't have access to, that in itself is interesting to me. I also just wanna make um, the point that thinking of language and the way it's spoken and thinking of language as a sonic texture that fills our everyday and fills our understanding of a place. I want to talk, of course, about indigenous language and its position in Australian um, uh, society and, and daily life and in Brisbane, um, specifically because, you know, the, the wonderful spoken exhibition at State Library of Queensland was on while I was doing part of this research. Um, and what was interesting to me, many things were interesting to me about the spoken um, exhibition. I went two or three times, I think. Um, and one thing that was interesting to me, thinking about the act of listening and thinking about what's active in our, in our sound space, um, is that this, this is from the virtual version that you can still see on, on State Library's website. That bit of um, spoken language from the Nonunku Yogara Aboriginal Dance Company and their welcoming ceremony, you can go through the entire spoken exhibition and you'll learn a lot about indigenous languages, but that can be the only time that you hear indigenous language spoken in the exhibition for very pressing and immediate and tragic reasons for the, for, you know, because there was a, a tremendous effort to silence that language. Um, and I think also of what um, uh, Rory O'Connor, the director of the Yoganda Museum uh, in, devoted to indigenous languages said at the Minya Biran, which I was also at, um, and he said like every, every Australian should know 10 words in language. And from my own point of view as interested in sound, I take that to mean not only that these, the meaning of these words should enter into our casual um, daily usage, but also the sound of the words. Just that this, the idea that Australian sounds a little indigenous um, is, has a very powerful effect on how we understand space. Even here with the spoken exhibition, you have to go into a special space or you have to live through a special time, a time of welcoming or of opening an, an event in order to really hear that indigenous language. Um, so, those are a lot of the thoughts that went into that went into this project, and now let's get into the project itself at long last. Uh, and in order to really address sound, I wanted to get away from sound as speech, sound as performance, as human performance, not because those things aren't interesting, but just because when we listen to somebody talking, we tend to get distracted by what they're actually saying. And I wanted to think about sound itself, the sound of things, the sound of everyday life. Uh, and something that Robin Hamilton of the State Library said in the lead up in the discovery for um, the application process has stuck with me ever since. The collection is only as accessible as the way we describe it. And this was something that really um, resounded for me as somebody who had dealt with you know, libraries all my life, certainly dealt with OneSearch, the State Library's catalog, and thinking about how to find sound when I started trying to find sound. Well, it turns out that a lot of it is not accessible, not because it's not there and not because we don't have access to it. In some cases, it's actually digitized. In this case, this, this entry it is. 
um, but because it's not very fully described. Um, a lot of materials that might be sound materials in the state library are hidden by one word descriptions like film, 16 millimeter, or, you know, 16 millimeter film, which might have sound, might not, you don't know. Um, or they're, um, they're described by subject matter, um, but what's, what's specifically about that subject matter, we don't quite know. Um, and so what it, what it, my, my basis for thinking about this was that there's a tremendous amount of sound that we could be investigating, um, whether it exists or not. We could just be thinking about the sounds that we can't hear. We need to sort of save the sounds that are still out there um, that have been recorded. Um, but we're not sure how to do that because we can't find the sounds we've already got. So this was my, my beginning point. And what I, what I suggested to the State Library is that I would think about how to better describe the sound, the sounds that we've already got, which might influence how we then collect sounds um, and, and um, um, deal with sound material in the future. So what we're looking at right here is the first web app that I made. Um, to, it sort of sits on top of OneSearch. It was a, my own little cataloging engine that I created so that I could store things in one search that I thought were interesting that I wanted to look into and um, uh, go into further detail with and, and like listen to and see what sounds were there. I thought at first that what I'd be doing with this residency was an enormous survey of all of their sounds or what might have sounds and I'd sort of catalog all of this and figure out what to make of it. It turned out very quickly that what I had to do first was to create tools to enable me to search for sounds and record and you know um, record what they were and uh, describe them for myself at least so that I could even perform the audits or the searches that I, I thought I would do. Um, so from there, from just isolating those records that um, I wanted to look into, I thought about, well, how can I describe these sounds, these long oral histories or these long documentaries or home movies? How can I look into them to see what sound materials they might have, um, like field recorded sound, other bits of sound? And how can I sort of make that more visible and describe it? And I decided to um, take a cue to model my cataloging descriptive efforts on a uh, a fairly common uh, cataloging model, which is of oral histories, the transcription. Um, and in particular, Tro's transcriptions are, are actually quite elegantly made, I think. Um, when you're listening to one of their oral histories, and this is an interview of John Rigby, um, you are seeing both the transcript of it and you're seeing the summary with keywords of each bit of text. So it's, so it's a very quite a long um, file, it's 45 minutes long but it's broken down and described so that you can sort of text search to where the sound is that you're interested in, in this case, the language. Um, and I'm gonna play a bit of this as well because um, this is another one of my sort of entry points to thinking about sound as historical material. This is John Rigby talking about walking to school as a young boy in Palin Creek, which is a town about an hour and a half uh, southwest of Brisbane. And I can remember the teacher going by on a horse in in uh, leather leggings and uh, with her, uh, you know, wrapping and such. Come on, John, <laughs> get a move on while she cantered off into the distance, you know. <laughs> so that's John Rigby performing a sound in order to um, relive a memory. The, like, wrapping on, the, the teacher wrapping on her leather leggings. Come on, John. Um, What's now? I thought that was a nice little moment of the story. What's interesting to me as a as a piece of description is that if you'll see the laughter that he do, that he does, the sort of nervous laughing, is an event. It's literally called an event in um, the transcription. But the actual performance, the rapping, which I think is actually is an event. It's much more narratively important. That doesn't get represented at all. And that's what I wanted to reverse. I wanted to say, no, we need to be looking for the sounds and not just these sort of, you know, takes of, of human voice. So I started to make my own transcription engine. Um, the, I call it a sound scraper. It's not really a sound scraper. That's just what I call it. It sounds neat to me. And I made a, I made a, a little web app whereby I could uh, look at things, first things that were digitized, but then things that are not digitized in the State Library's collection, and just sort of look through them for sound, or listen, actually, through them for sounds. And then I could list those sounds, as you can see here, and identify them, you know, where they are, how long they last, 
uh, and so forth. And so now I'm going to mostly switch over and talk about some sounds that I discovered or the ways that I discovered them. Um, let's in fact go to Gary Maloney. He's right here. Um, Gary Maloney made a documentary in the 1990s for local TV, I believe, um, called Palin Creek of Changing Community. So the same, same community. Um, and it's a long video documentary for which he recorded a lot of himself walking around Palin Creek. He recorded a lot of the landscape. And so there are a lot of long stretches of sort of descriptive panning with the video, which means field recording of uh, Palin Creek as it was at that time. So you'll get a lot of, um, I've made this. There we go. This is the sound of Palin Creek. Um, it's, in fact, it's the sound of a, a hillside, which, and it's the sound of the wind on the microphone. So it doesn't seem super specific to Palin Creek until you realize perhaps the ways in which Palin Creek has changed over the time, over time. So that, for instance, something that interested me is this very long shot, 20, second, 20 seconds of the visuals, but also for me, the sound, uh, if my internet connection doesn't betray me of um, a red cedar. And again, this is a red cedar standing in the middle of a field in, uh, oh, okay. just maybe try to go thing there. Uh, standing in the middle of a field. You might have to trust me, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a red cedar standing by itself in the middle of a field. And so it's just this, the sound of an open field. Red cedars used to cover the hills in this area. There were enormous forests of them and they all went by for the forest in industry. And now it's very difficult to grow red cedars in that area because of the pest um, that, that to which they're very vulnerable. And so when you're hearing this sort of non-sound of a tree standing in a field, what you're hearing is what the sound isn't anymore you're not hearing the forest, the, the ambient sound of the forest, which sounds like a very subtle difference, but it is a very profound difference as well. Elsewhere, um, we hear, perhaps this one will work, uh, kids in shop class, um, which again, we know what that sounds like. It's not such a big deal until we realize that what we're hearing is the sound of kids being trimmed. Oh. Probably most of us have heard that sound before. What we're hearing in this case is the sound of kids being trained not to work on their parents' dairy farms, but to get um, higher paying industrial jobs in, the t in town. Um, and so this again is, is the sound of something that's been replaced. What it's replacing is actually right up here, um, kids and cows. So this was, a, this was the very first test case that I did, um, mining a, a piece of media for sound. And it was, I thought, very fruitful. I thought I loved doing this um, for a couple of reasons. First off, there's just a lot of sound there. And it was very interesting to think how I could pick it out of the video that was going on and just listen for the sound itself. Um, but also because it made apparent to me that listening to the sound for us as viewers, for us as, as um, people getting into the catalog and thinking about what's here and what does it mean, listening to the sound is not separable from the narrative context of the sound. And in the case of Gary Maloney's documentary, this is very um, helpfully, Gary Maloney narrates all of the meaning of the sound for us. It's like him talking about Palin Creek. So I was able here to have not just a subject, this is what the sound is, but a description. Um, so like this is, uh, he was talking about drinking from the, he, this is the sound of him drinking from the creek here. And he's talking about um, how they tried irrigation, but the water has too much salt in it. So it, the irrigation tents all failed. Um, and so those sounds suddenly become denser in a way with meaning if you understand the story behind them and they become a way to sort of get at history in a sense. Um, I have, as always, talked excitedly about, about ideas. Um, so I'll fast forward. Well, I won't fast forward, but I'm going to, I'm going to talk about some other sounds. Um, I'm going to talk about the types of sounds that I was able to identify. What I'm, what I'm looking at a lot of here are field recorded sounds, original sounds, which is what I originally thought of when I thought of archived sounds, sounds from the past that have been recorded, that we're lucky enough to be recorded and that we now have access to. 
But that's only one way, actually, that we use sound to um, uh, think about the past and to evoke the past. Uh, another way, the most common way in museums and in history, is also here in Palin Creek. Again, this is, Gary Maloney grew up in Palin Creek, so a lot of what this is is him field recording his childhood or the way that he remembered it. Um, and some things are just gone. The school had been torn down by the, the one room schoolhouse had been torn down by the time he made this documentary. So um, if this decides to play. That was not actually recorded on the site that you're seeing. Um, it's a sound effect that he found somewhere probably in a sound effects library and just is using to stand in for um, the old fashioned schoolhouse that we all sort of know or think that we know from watching TV. Um, similarly with the sawmill, uh, he, he uses a, a prefab recording of a sawmill in operation because none of the sawmills in Palin Creek are, are there anymore. Um, so again, this is a very obvious of a sort of cinematic way of using sound, the expected sound perhaps to evoke the past. Um, I'm going to move over here and talk about my other favorite type of sound, which is, um, as John Rigby demonstrated for us, described sound. So sound that doesn't actually exist, but that um, people are using to um, evoke something about the past. This is, I got very interested, and I'll go into this in a bit more in a sec. I got very interested in, in cane farming, um, being new to Queensland. It seemed, I was sort of interested in something that I didn't know anything about, so I would really be forced to learn a tremendous amount and di dig in. Um, and uh, so that, uh, the State Library has a lot of oral histories of uh, the sugar cane industry in uh, Mackay and other places. Uh, this is uh, from the, from a, a uh, project about 20 years ago called Sweet Talking. It's, it's a bunch of people who are involved with the sugar industry talking about it. Uh, and this is John Camilleri. Uh, things like that. And uh, we sort of did, uh, we plotted them out and things like that. And we got, uh, in the end, we got uh, very good maps mm. and uh, things like that. You did this for filing mills? Yes, yes, with a prismatic compass and a, uh, in, a, in a tape, you know. We used to do it by chain and we got a tape and mm. uh, sort of revolutionize the whole thing with uh, sticks, measuring sticks and things like that, you know what I mean? None of this business will go there or make a noise like a piece of cane and all this business, you know, if you got lost around the corner. You know, a noise like a piece, a of, piece cane. of cane, yeah. Well, you uh, you know, you've got grass over your head, yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? And then, and then you've got a bloke that's right in the snakes and you yeah. uh, take about half an hour to uh, walk uh, 100 metres or 50 metres and next thing, you know, you're lost in. And say, no, make a noise like a piece of cane. Find out where the hell are you. The next minute he might be around the corner or he'd be just in front of you. You know, you couldn't. So make a noise like a piece of cane. This is not actually the sound of somebody making a noise like a piece of cane. What it is, though, is the sound of two men lost in a cane field, right? Or lost in the tall grass, I should say. Um, and so he's, what he's talking about is surveying, like how they surveyed um, for the sugar mill or for the sugar farmers um, back in the day. Um, and the way that that changed over time. But what he segues into is the experience of walking around. Um, and that gives us something that we didn't otherwise know. And that idea, not, not of somebody standing very still making a noise like a piece of cane, but somebody shouting, make a noise like a piece of cane to somebody that they can't see because of the tall grass and the rustling of the grass and so forth. That is evocative. Um, and uh, there, there's a lot of moments like this in the Sweet Talking Oral History. It's talking about, you know, like the sound of cars coming up a lonely dirt road or how long it took to get from Akai to Bundaberg at that time. And you were sort of bouncing in and out of ruts and, and so forth. So a lot of, a lot of um, textured moments of life as it was lived there around that time in, um, that, that we can sort of, that I want to get at through sound. Uh, I'm going to talk about just certainly this one, this one thing. Um, and then if I have time, I, we might see if there are any questions and then I'll talk, I'll close with one further example of actually silent sound. Um, so this is, uh, I was thinking again after the Nina Biran, I was thinking about indigenous language and the sound of indigenous language and how to find it. Um, and just the fact for, from my own point of view, I hear very little indigenous um, language in my daily life. And of course here in, in Brisbane, um, quite close to uh, where I live and work, um, those languages, specifically the Turbo language, uh, is um, 
uh, exists largely in writing, in the writing of 19th century um, Englishmen who are, uh, who are transcribing what uh, people are hearing. But elsewhere in Queensland, um, languages are still extant and still vibrant. Um, this is a, a digital story that was made some time ago about the Queensland Indigenous Languages Program. It's specifically about the Hope Vale Language Workshop, where a lot of really interesting work is being done. And again, after Minya Biron, I was really interested in, in where I could hear this language. And so I, I basically, I, I, I sound mind this, this um, film, which is about half an hour, for the moments of spoken uh, um, Indigenous language, in this case, uh, uh, Gugu Yimitir. Um, and we're, we're perhaps not super surprised. There's, there's not a ton. There's a lot of Indigenous peoples talking about language and talking about what, what language means. But um, those, those, hello? Those moments um, of of speaking the language itself are few and far between, and because you know, because like not everybody's going to watch the entire twenty six minute movie. Um, I think it. I thought perhaps it might be at least valuable to isolate those moments and to say here, here's where the word is. Here, here's where a phrase is. Now, of course, I can't do this um, in great uh, with great accuracy or or um, uh, uh, knowledge because I don't speak Google either there. Um, this is where, you know, it were this tool to go forward, were we to integrate these kinds of strategies into um, cataloging practice at the State Library or elsewhere, um, it would need to become a community effort. And so, like, version 2.0 or 3.0 of these web app tools would um, need to be able to incorporate community engagement in the way that, for instance, the Corley Explorer at the State Library, they're fantastically successful um, uh, uploading and crowdsourcing of information for all of the 60,000 photos in the Corley archive. Um, that as a community project has been quite successful. There are now like over 2000 stories contributed by people about houses of which there are photos in that archive and something, some sort of um, community engagement like that would be great because again, I, I undertook this project in the knowledge that, you know, I, I, I'm good at cataloging, I'm good at tools, I'm good at historical research, but I'm not in a position of authority to understand, recognize, and bring forward the sounds that I'm interested in investigating. So at a certain point, what I'm doing here is actually listening for what needs to be listened to, in a way of listening for the silences so that I can then ask people, what does this sound like, or what is this sound? Um, I think we've got a few questions, but I'm going to end with, with your indulgence. Um, the one kind of sound that I haven't talked about yet, which is missing sound. Uh, a lot of um, sounds in archives are not there because when we talk about audiovisual materials, a lot of them are silent films, home movies in particular. Um, and we think of those films as silent. Now, the thing is that silent films, both in recording and in playing back, are not actually that silent. Like the experience of listening to a silent home movie um, isn't silent. It is silent if you're watching it on your computer with your headphones on, there's just no other input. But if you're watching a home movie in your lounge with your family, you're hearing the sound of the projector, if it's a film. You're hearing your uncle tell the same story he always tells when you watch this home movie. You're hearing things happening in the kitchen. You're hearing the sounds outside. Um, all watching experiences of home movies were originally sound experiences, not just the sounds that were there in the original um, uh, space that got recorded visually, but not sonically, but also in the playback. There's some kind of audio that, that happened just by, by being a spectator. I'm going to skip through all this stuff and talk about the new piece of footage in not the new, the old archival piece of footage that I'm obsessed with now, which is a um, piece of silent film, a home movie, that as I said, I became really interested in, in uh, the cane fields and the history of the cane fields in central and north Queensland and the history of um, uh, well, first, you know, Aboriginal um, pre-cane um, uh, culture, then South Sea Islanders, then, you know, waves of other immigrants, then, you know, tourism industry, there's a lot going on there that I was, that I thought was really fascinating. It's really sort of just a lot, a lot to know. Um, and so I was, as I was looking for sound stuff to, uh, 
to investigate, I started to search for work and I started to search for cane farming. And I came across this um, Doug Perrin's motion picture archive in which um, there's one sentence, cane farming and cane cutting. I didn't know if this had sound or not, but I just was like, oh, okay, maybe there's just some footage, maybe some sound, maybe just like some picture of you know people cutting cane and however they did back then. And so I went looking for this and it is digitized. Um, and I, I wanna make a point here about like how we catalog in terms of technology even and the ways that technology that we use for catalog stays relevant and stays accessible. Um, they're online as real player clips, all these films. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers real player. It was big in the nineties. It was literally the first technology for streaming video. Um, I was, <laughs> I'll be honest, I was a bit surprised to find that it still exists, but it does. Um, I couldn't watch these on my Mac. I, it kept hanging fire right before the part of the video that I wanted to watch. So I found a, finally, I found a piece of software called uh, Real Converter, but it doesn't work on Mac. So I had to go get a PC and then I unloaded it and then I down, finally downloaded it and I, I watched it. And the, the bit on cane farming turns out to be this. It's 15 seconds long. Hello, hello, and that's it. Um, now, perhaps weirdly, but um, it's true, maybe because of all the effort I went through, sort of, to uh, find this clip, I became obsessed with the sounds that I could put in here, the space of this, this little clip from the 19, I believe, late 1950s. Um, and imagine putting different soundtracks to it as a piece of cinematography even. This was my um, sort of quick mind map diagram of all of the sorts of sounds that I could put to this clip and then replay it in different contexts so that you would get a different sense of what's going on in this clip. Um, what if um, I have the sound of a harvester, a machine harvester harvesting cane? What if I have the sound of people harvesting cane by hand? What if I have the sound of Italian immigrants talking themselves in Italian? What if I have the sound of Italian immigrants talking themselves a bit in Australian accents like John Camieri did? He's, a, he's Italian, but he has a very old fashioned, you know, working class Australian male accent. Um, South Sea Islanders um, speaking conversationally. Uh, indigenous cultures speaking without the cane there. Um, then on the other hand, we have tourism because these guys were on a day trip from Brisbane up or from the Brisbane area up towards uh, central and north Queensland. So there's something there about um, taking day trips to see where people cut the cane. That's a little, that's some interesting things there about class and so forth. Um, so like what if I put tourism, um, historical tourism uh, radio ads over, what does that say? Um, and I became, this is my ongoing project, I became really interested in this idea of re-watching this single bit of footage over and over again, but with um, bits of sound from various archives, not just from State Library, hopefully a lot from State Library, but there's also a large repository of um, field recording and oral histories of the Bundaberg area, uh, Kane specifically, um, in uh, the National Library. So that, and of course I got a little stymied here because of COVID, I can't, or I can only this week now go down to the National Library again. Um, but that's sort of next for me is assembling all of the sounds that could potentially fill this um, tiny little uh, clip, which by the way, this is the, this is the size that it is. Um, if, you, if you download the broadband real player, um, uh, clip, and I kind of like it being that size. I kind of like it being so small and so so um, detailed that I have to fill it. I have to surround it with sound and surround it with history. All right, that's me. I'm going to stop talking now. Um, hopefully, we've still got some time left for questions, and I'm going to hand it back over, or at least ask Gavin to join me and stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Seth. I think it's very telling that I actually need to press an unmute, unmute button to, to rejoin this conversation, <laughs> but um, I think it's very telling how um, important audio is. Um, so if, thank you. We've got a few questions in here, and I'll 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 probably I'll just go through those. And I've got a few reflections of my own, which which I think it, it was a fascinating um, sort of look, and the way that you are looking at archival collections is um, different and. I say eye-opening, but I should probably say ear-opening. Like it, 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 it opens a world which is 
tremendously exciting for me as somebody who manages a, a historical collection. Um, did so Annette Mills um, gave uh, a gave a question uh, talking about um, a particular a sparrow in North America, which I think just to, to uh, summarize, I think over time and noise pollution, it had um, adjusted its behavior to increase um, its frequency and volume, I think to, to adjust to, to road noise. But during COVID um, that actually decreased and researchers have noticed a, a, an adaptation in the behaviour of that of that bird. Um, I suppose a, a fascinating, and I encourage anyone to, to check that out. It's called a height crowned sparrow. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, in response to that? Did you have anything, any thoughts in response to that, Seth? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, that's actually a great great um, example of how reconstructed sound is often a bit illusory, right? Because like if we say, I, okay, I know that height-crowned sparrows used to be in this area, so I'm going to go record a height-crowned sparrow and that will be, you know, that's going to be my, my um, reconstruction of the sound of this place in the past. Well, it turns out that even the sparrows sound differently than they did back then. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so it's, it's a great example of how like a, a particular place at a particular time has a particular sonic nature. Um, and investigating that really, to me, just creates perhaps a lot more questions. I'm sorry, my cat has just joined. Um, mm -hmm. It creates a lot more uh, questions in a productive way. It, it, it requires us to, to think about the history and to think about um, how this place is, or how these sounds have changed in a way that goes deeper than, well, there didn't used to be traffic, now there's traffic. Um, you know, the, the, the forest was actually quite a noisy place in a lot of ways. I think my cat's safely out of the way now. Um, but, you know, so a lot of sound had to be, like, like the, in, in the same way that the forest was decimated in order to create the city, this, excuse me, I can do a magic trick. Um, in the same way that the forest had to be decimated to uh, create the city, the sounds of the forest had to be muted um, in order to create a different sound um, territory for us now. Um, is there anything also just uh, so on in terms of what I think it's really compelling your research because we're spending a lot of you know money and effort to reformat and digitize collections but cultural institutions are all in the business of trying to elicit memory and reflection or deep and understanding with people. But to me, sound, which is a vehicle to be able to achieve that, we probably haven't paid it enough attention. And I think there's kind of fertile ground there to, to utilize. I mean, we do like, you know, soundscapes and exhibitions and sort of basic stuff. But I, I suppose my question is, if we get more sophisticated with how we treat and manage sound, are we able to possibly achieve our charters as cultural institutions better? I mean, I think what, it, it, it's not, you know, we're not, we're not suggesting a shift to from, you know, like, we're not going to do this anymore. We're, we're, we're going to do, you know, sonic or full multi-sensory experiences. Um, but there, there are a lot of opportunities, I think, to add to the things that institutions already do. Um, and I think a lot of that, you know, my concern with this project was thinking about in a way, sort of putting off thinking about the front end for a while of, of how, we, um, how we present sound to audiences and how we create convincing soundscapes and how people can engage with it. And thinking a bit about how we engage with it as people who are you know, engaged with an archive, how we describe and, and organize and collect them in ways that will hopefully then not just make it easier for people to access and you know, like understand those sounds, but also will invite them into in some sense, the cataloging process, um, like as, as is happening with the Corley Explorer, and you know, I know that those guys also spoke at, at making meaning about the emergent archive that comes when all of these people are telling stories about their houses. You know, that's also um, it's not just people reacting to the archive; it becomes historical material in its own sense and is is worth saving um, because you know those those stories, even more than the photos, are are um, both ephemeral and super valuable in terms of understanding the past. 
And that's where um, I'm seeing Tanya's question here, if I could skip ahead a sec, about different formats of resources and how do we store them and how do we make sure that they stay accessible for future generations. That is, of course, I'm Gavin, you know this better than I do, that that's, that's the essential question. And um, right now it's just kind of best guess at, you know, like, well, not quite. Um, a lot of people have been working for a long time at creating um, standards, best standards, and uh, the standard file formats that we're just going to agree that, you know, no matter what happens, we will all mm -hmm. always have to um, be able to interpret JPEGs as, as, as image files. We will all always have to be able to listen to WAV files and MP3s. Um, and to a degree over the past 20 years, those, those things are settling out. Um, like there's there's some there's some more agreement around the standard file formats that we'll all just have to deal with because standardization is more important than um, in some cases than audio fidelity. You know, like the MP3 is such so common that it it's quite a lossy format in some ways, but um, it's so common that we kind of it's too late to do without it at this point. Um, so so that's a big thing. Um, just, just file formats and where they get stored is another thing. Um, and Gavin, you I'm sure are, no, are more qualified to answer this than me, but just th thinking about, you know, a server is just, a, you know, the, the database that I'm making mm -hmm. sits on a server. A server is just a computer in a room somewhere. It mm -hmm. could crash, you know, it could, um, like if, if people stop uh, maintaining it, it could, it could die. And then mm -hmm. everything that's on that database um, including sound materials, including written materials, that's no longer there. Mm. Um, so part of the irony of what we're doing in terms of working with digitized archive, digitizing everything is one thing. Working with new archives of digitized materials or the natively digital materials like stories, like sounds and so forth. Um, we have to, you know, like they're much more fragile and ephemeral they're more accessible, but they're more fragile and ephemeral than physical objects that have been sitting around for, in some cases, you know, thousands of years, let alone, let alone decades. And that's something that we just need to navigate. And that is sort of still pretty much up in the air. Like we're not really sure what best cases are between, you know, like, do we print stuff out? Do we, you know, record all these sounds to vinyl so that we, we can, you know, sock them in a basement somewhere? We don't really know. Yeah, digital preservation. So that's a that that could we could spend a whole session on digital preservation for sure. Yeah. Um, thanks, Tanya, for your question. Um, there's a question as well, just about I suppose if people and it's true we, we did a motion picture digitization project um, for um, you know people to donate their home movies and things like that. We digitized a whole lot. Um, I suspect this is probably one of my staff asking this question, so I'm not going to out them, but um, <laughs> got that sort of like institutional angle. Um, so I think, but you, you know, truly, are you as a researcher, what do you find useful in information that's provided with a recording? And what is it that people can provide if they're donating material to institutions such as us? What can they provide that would assist researchers now and into the future? I think, I mean, what I've found, I think, most useful is, or what I found most evocative in terms of looking for sounds, and particularly looking for described sounds, is really sort of those passing moments that people don't really realize quite that they're describing. Like if you ask somebody, what was the sound of your kitchen in 1962? Um, they probably won't know. Um, but if you say, you know, so what was, what was it like, you know, to like just describe a, a, you know, average evening in your home in 1962, um, they might come up with, for instance, one of the slides that I skipped through was for, was actually from the Corley Explorer. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read a bit. This is from 32 Plunkett, just across the street from me here. Um, and uh, I can also recall the lino covered squeaky floorboards as you walked through the house and the house swayed if you decided to chase your brothers or sisters through the house. So these tiny little moments of, of you know, um, the squeaky lino and maybe the, the house shifting a little bit and groaning as, as you rock it back and forth because it's on stilts and we're on a hill. Um, so I think just um, accompanying narrative, like not, not um, thinking too hard about uh, um, uh, what, you're, what you're narrating along with this film 
I have another example, actually. So well, well before I came to Australia, uh, one of the first things that interested me in sound was I was living in North Carolina and there was a product, a pro that project um, in the 1930s of this guy who went around North Carolina and took a ton of documentary, silent documentary footage of a bunch of North Carolina towns. Um, and it was really not very well. I mean, it was just like he would take, he would point the camera at the factory as people were walking out for lunch. And so all of these people would file back the, past the camera and be like, what, what are you doing? And that was kind of it. So they're not very interesting films, except for the people who are in them. And so I found on YouTube, somebody years later in the 90s, um, two old fellows from North Carolina um, sitting down with a, with a VHS of one of these films and narrating the whole thing. Like that's John and that's Rod and that's Be um, Bella and we used to eat there for lunch. And, and so like that just idea of like using, f using home films, using sounds um, as a, as as a as a um, an excuse to narrate to us to to sort of narrate the film to us or narrate the the, the past to us in a way, um, without being too like um, tying yourself up about what what people are are uh, what specific materials are looking for, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, we've just we're getting close to time, so I'll just quickly whip through that we've had some very interesting kind of questions and reflections from people. So Sarah um, just points out the work from Annie Breslin from the National Film and Sound Archive, um, doing work again with bird recordings and recorded bird song from France, um, put into the War Memorial um, World War One galleries, Australian birds sound so different to, to other birds. Um, so, you know, thanks for sharing that, Sarah. I think that's, um, that's really, interesting how um some of those and i i, I you know was, was thinking just you know i'm in a different place i'm on north stradbroke island and the curlews are very loud you know here and it's like that sound of a curlew i grew up i was in my 20s before i realized what that sound was you know and it's such a mournful sound it's it's quite um nothing else so sorry yeah we could do a bird song sort of that'll be our next our next <laughs> um, so, um, and then Adam just points out a, a podcast audio play called Forest 404, where it's basically about w what Seth you're doing, but in the future where nature nature doesn't exist. It's a dystopian fictional story pod play, but I think you'd both appreciate it. Yeah, wow. cool. I'll have to look into it. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Sarah, as well. Yeah. Um, so any, any final reflections or thoughts, next steps for your research, um, Seth? How can people stay in touch? Um, well, uh, I'll be continuing on with this. I, like I have some sort of polishing and, and um, sort of tightening up of the online web tools that I've been doing. I'd like to you know, present them to you, Gavin, and then maybe uh, we can think about whether they're, like, I mean, I'd love to, I know that the Coralie Explorer is chugging towards a version 2.0. Yeah. I'd love to, um, Think about how you know, like and we've talked a, a tiny bit about how you know, like media might be incorporated, whether in that or in just sort of like public cataloging tools. I think that would be great. Um, and in terms of uh, my own work, well, not my own work, um, the the creative work that I'm in, embarked on with this piece of cane footage. Um, what's next for me is is a ton of of uh, research in different archives. Now that we're starting to be able to travel again, um, I can actually do sort of the analog version of this research and go to buildings with uh, sound materials in them and actually listen to them um, on site. Um, so that's, that's, that's where I'm at. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I think we could just talk about sound forever. And it, I think that's, um, you know, there's something there. And I think, thank, I just on behalf of everyone who's tuned in, I just like to thank you for your enthusiasm. And I suppose just your real sort of connection and intelligence, the way you've been able to quickly adapt and you know, sort of being a sponge for information is, is an amazing thing to see. Um, so I just want to thank you for your presentation. Um, and I'll just start to wrap up this presentation um, by just saying that our Queensland Memory Awards will open for 2021 um, in January next year, early next year. So stay tuned for the Queensland, um, State Library of Queensland webpage um, uh, in December, January and um, we'll put all the information about the Queensland Memory Awards and the fellowships that are available to you. Uh, and then I'll also remind you that on the 15th of February, Trisha King will be giving her presentation on um, the, ice cream fact the Ice Cream Factory in Peters. And here's my son, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs>
fresh from the beach. <laughs> that was our ice cream. Ah, my new ice cream. Ice cream memories. There we go. It but, was. <laughs> I had a new flavor. Strawberry milkshake. That's literally the flavor. That's great. Yum. Thanks for tuning in, and um, this recording will be available online soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Thanks, sir. <laughs>